Hi, everybody. Welcome to our presentation of Indian Meal Molasses, the Making of New England Cuisines. My name is Krista. I'm one of the librarians here in Poughkeepsie. And please join me in welcoming Sarah Wasberg Johnson, also known as the food historian. She'll be presenting uh, on this topic tonight. So aside from appearing in several academic journals and publications, Sarah recently made an appearance uh, on the History Channel's miniseries, The Food That Built America. So she definitely knows her food. And so some, just a little bit of housekeeping for tonight. Um, I do have you all muted at the moment and please also turn off your cameras if they are on as well. We'll have time at the end of the presentation for any questions or comments. Um, so I'll let you unmute yourselves uh, at that time. If you have any questions you wanna ask directly, but please use the chat during the presentation if you wanna put anything in the chat, question related or comments. And Sarah will get to that when she gets a chance. So that's all for me. So I'm gonna pass this along to Sarah and enjoy. Thanks so much, Krista, for that introduction and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we're gonna be doing two things tonight. First, I have a film, a recorded cooking demonstration that I'm gonna play for everybody. Um, we'll pause after the cooking demo if anybody has any question. And then we're gonna go into the uh, more history-based presentation. So, um, as Chris has said, you can drop your questions in the chat. I'll try to monitor them during the, um, the uh, recorded portion. We'll pause for questions and then we'll switch over to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to ask Chris to monitor the chat during the PowerPoint because when I'm talking, when I get interrupted, sometimes I lose my train of thought. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to go ahead and get started with the recording. Hey everybody, welcome to my kitchen. I'm Sarah Wasberg Johnson, also known as the food historian, and today we're going to be making Indian pudding, specifically Amelia Simmons' recipe for Indian pudding. Amelia Simmons was the author of what's considered one of the first American cookbooks, published in 1796. She actually has three recipes for Indian pudding. We're going to be making number two. So she calls for three pints of scalded milk to one pint of meal, that is cornmeal, salted. Cool. Add two eggs, four ounces of butter, sugar or molasses, and spice. It will require two and a half hours of baking. Indian pudding is a traditional uh, New England dish. It does take a long time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. She calls for scalding the milk first, so I've got this nice cast iron Dutch oven. And she measures in pints, but there are two cups to a pint. So three pints of milk. I'm using whole milk means six cups of milk. Now, scalding milk, you've maybe seen that before in historic recipes. That just means that you are heating the milk, not quite to boiling. You don't want it to boil. And what we're gonna do after that is uh, we're going to add our cornmeal. Sorry, I have to count. <laughs> I think I'm counting right. That looks like six. Once the milk is warm, we're gonna add our cornmeal. And what that does is it cooks the cornmeal a little bit um, so that it loses some of that grittiness and absorbs the milk. Then once that's done, we're gonna let it cool. Uh, and then we're gonna add the rest of our ingredients and bake. All right, see you in a minute. Okay, so our milk is nice and hot now. You can test it um, just by sticking your finger in the milk, which is what I did. Don't worry, I have clean hands. Um, again, you want it hot to the touch, but not boiling. I have measured out here um, two cups of stone ground yellow cornmeal, and we're gonna add that gradually to the milk, and you're gonna need a balloon whisk. So in the period, they probably would have used a wooden spoon, but the important thing is to add the cornmeal gradually. You add it all at once to a hot liquid, you're gonna end up with lumps, which you don't want. All right, here we go. Okay, so I've got my cornmeal. 
Okay, it's all incorporated in. We're gonna let it cook, stirring occasionally for about 10 minutes until it thickens up a little bit. Okay, that actually didn't take 10 minutes. It was more like four or five minutes. But as you can maybe see, the pudding has really thickened up um, and it's quite hot. Now, Amelia says to let things cool before you start to add the other ingredients, but the only thing you really need to let it cool for is the eggs. So I thought, while it's still hot, we would add some of our other ingredients and let them incorporate while it's cooling. So, she calls for adding four ounces of butter. Now, luckily for us today, um, butter comes in pre-measured sticks, and a stick of butter is a half a cup which is also four ounces, lucky us. So I'm gonna put the whole stick of butter in. Um, she also calls for spice. So I have measured out um, about a half teaspoon each of ginger and cinnamon. You can put in a little more or a little less if you like. Um, and then of course, because this is an 18th century recipe, we have to have some nutmeg, fresh grated nutmeg. So I have my microplane and what's left of a little nutmeg. Um, I'm just gonna add a couple gratings. Fresh nutmeg is a lot stronger than pre-ground nutmeg. So you don't need as much as you think. Now, um, Amelia also calls for molasses and sugar or sugar. And um, she doesn't tell you how much of either. So I'm gonna do a half cup of molasses and just a little bit of sugar. Sugar in the 18th century, um, especially refined white sugar was still quite expensive, which is why so many people used molasses, which is very cheap. Um, so I'm just gonna do my half a cup of molasses. And then we'll add maybe like a quarter cup or so of sugar. And of course, molasses is quite sticky. Um, some people like to oil their cups before they put the molasses in. I didn't do that in large part because I didn't really want to, but you can if you want to, if you don't want to have to deal with the sticky mess of trying to get the molasses out. And then I'm just gonna guesstimate about a quarter cup of white sugar. All right, so I'm gonna give it a good stir to incorporate everything and then let it cool. Then we'll add our eggs, put it in our baking dish, and stick it in the oven. Well, I went and did a very 18th century thing. It's quite a chilly day out today and I have an unheated porch, so I actually put the hasty pudding out on the porch to cool. Gave it a stir every once in a while, and now at this point, it's not quite cold, but it's warm enough that we can add the eggs. So in the 18th century, eggs were a lot smaller than they are now. And I actually only happen to have jumbo eggs on hand, but I'm decided I'm still gonna go with two eggs for this recipe because I think the pudding needs um, the custardiness of the eggs. So. I'll leave that up to you. Most eggs in the 18th century were about the size of medium modern eggs or smaller. Um, I'm gonna go a little overboard this time around in part because the Indian pudding number one in Amelia Simmons' cookbook calls for seven eggs. So I don't think she would begrudge me two, two giant eggs in this recipe. Now, of course, the reason why you have to wait for the, um, the cooked cornmeal to cool before you add the eggs is because you don't want to cook them and end up with scrambled eggs in your pudding, which would be bad. But this is cool enough that the eggs are not scrambling, which is great. Just gonna give it a good mix and then we'll put it in our baking dish. and I have here a nice big oval baking dish that I've buttered well because I don't want the pudding to stick. 
Um, if you don't have a dish like this, a ceramic dish, you can use a glass 9 by 13 baking dish and that should be enough. The bad thing about cast iron is always how heavy it is. Okay, it looks like our Indian pudding is just about ready, so I'm going to take it out, let it cool, and then we'll give it a taste. Okay, so some time has passed. Our Indian pudding has cooled down a little bit. I don't know if you can see, but um, it's got this weird crust that has fallen. Uh, it was all puffed up when it came out of the oven and it's fallen a little bit. So we're going to dig in and give it a taste. Now in the 20th century, um, it becomes very popular to serve Indian pudding uh, with ice cream, vanilla ice cream, which I do not have. But that's okay because they didn't really use that in the 18th century. Anyway, they may have served it with cream um, or maybe with a custard, but probably they just served it the way it is. So it's got this little crust on it. It is kind of eggy, <laughs> which I knew going in with the jumbo eggs. So we're going to give it a taste. It doesn't really taste that much like corn at all, surprisingly. It's nice. It's not very sweet, but I knew that going in. Um, if you wanted to adapt to more modern recipes, um, a lot of modern recipes call for a half cup of molasses and as much as a half a cup to a cup of sugar. Uh, either white or brown sugar. We only put about a quarter of a cup or less of white sugar in. But it is very good. I can see why people in the turn of the 20th century got so interested in this. Yeah, the la the I was a little skeptical about the long cooking time. Um, but I think it was necessary because the cornmeal is totally soft. It's no, not crunchy. There's no little gritty bits of uncooked cornmeal in there. And this crust, which I was quite skeptical about, is actually very nice. So there you have it. Not very pretty to look at, but Amelia Simmons 1796 Indian pudding recipe. Very good, and I recommend it. Okay, so it looks like we had a couple of questions in the chat. So let me just take a look here. Okay, Carla asks, what was the 1700s version of a microplane? They actually did have a specific kitchen tool for grating nutmeg that was a very similar um, style. You know, it was like basically holes punched through metal. Um, so like the grating edge is on the outside and it was hollow. So it would catch the um, nutmeg and like it would go down into wherever you wanted it. Uh, you definitely could top it with maple syrup. It was pretty sweet on its own. Even the less sweet version that I made. Um, if you put vanilla ice cream on top, that would be plenty sweet. 
um, but you could also try it with maple syrup instead of molasses. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. Oh, Carla, how do I keep from scraping my fingertips with the nutmeg? <laughs> you have to do it kind of carefully, for sure. There is also little sides um, that help, but yes, it's like grating anything. You don't have to be careful of where your fingertips are. All right, so I'm going to stop this share. Are there any other questions before we go into um, the historical discussion? No? I think there was one other question, Sarah. Um, Can I miss it? What temperature should you bake the pudding at? Oh my gosh, did I not say that? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, it's 325 degrees is what I baked it at. Um, so it's a little bit lower temperature, sometimes called like a slow oven. Um, you could probably even do it at 300. Uh, it did get quite brown at 325. Um, and of course, historically, they would have used a bake oven, uh, which would have uh, cooled gradually as it was baking. So um, yes, I'm, I can't believe I didn't put that in there. So thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we switch over? No? Okay, I'm going to share now the PowerPoint section. Come on. Okay, so I wanted, I've been wanting to make Indian pudding for a really long time. It was actually my first time ever making it or tasting it. It does show up a lot in vintage cookbooks. Um, and for those of you who can see behind me, the in my cookbook library, I have a ton of vintage cookbooks. Uh, and it's really indicative of New England cuisine. So when I put together this talk, I wanted to take a look at what goes into what went into the creation of New England cuisine and kind of the relationship and the importance of Indian meal or cornmeal and molasses and kind of how those fit into um, American history. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And again, if you have questions as we go, drop them in the chat or we'll open everything up at the end for questions. All right, so we're gonna talk first with what is pudding? Maybe when you signed up for this talk, when you heard the term Indian pudding and you didn't know what that was, maybe you thought it was a little bit more like the chocolate custard illustration here from the Saturday Evening Post, right? In America, in the United States in particular, we tend to think of pudding as like jello pudding. Um, it's either a custard, an egg thickened custard, or later on we get the cornstarch thickened custard. It's a sweet, creamy dessert. Um, on the other side there, we have a Christmas pudding, which is the British version of pudding, um, which is either steamed or boiled. It's very dense, um, usually sticky. Christmas puddings are full of dried fruits, kind of like fruitcake. Um, and those types of puddings were designed uh, to be cooked in a liquid, usually either steamed in a mold where you have you put it in a kettle with liquid in the bottom and the mold stands free and steams, or if the very early versions would be boiled in a pudding bag and you would actually boil them in the liquid. So that's normally what is considered pudding um, in England. And Indian pudding is kind of a fusion of the two. So it's called Indian pudding after an early sort of terminology that referred to cornmeal as Indian meal or Indian flour. Um, so, of course, most of us probably know that the word Indian is a misnomer that Christopher Columbus applied to Indigenous people when he came to the Caribbean, and it sort of got applied to all Indigenous people in North and South America um, because he thought he had landed in India, which was totally not the case. Um, so, the version of grain that a lot of Europeans first encountered among indigenous people was corn. So they called, um, also known as ZMAs or maize. Uh, so they called theirs Indian meal or Indian flour to differentiate between um, that indigenous food and the foods that they had brought with them from Europe, from England in particular, New England. 
Um, Indian pudding is also kind of starts out as pasty pudding. And I didn't say this in the video because I forgot. Pasty pudding has a long history in Europe. It's essentially um, you're cooking a finely ground grain, um, flour usually, uh, in hot water or milk until it makes like this thick paste. And it's called pasty pudding because you can do it very quickly. Um, boiled and steamed puddings take two to three hours to cook. Um, a hasty pudding, you can do it over open flame or on a stove top. It's very quick. Um, here in the United States, hasty pudding was made with cornmeal. It's sometimes also called cornmeal mush. Uh, and so what I made on the stove top for an Indian pudding recipe before we added anything into it, that was hasty pudding, which is why I refer to it as hasty pudding at one point in the video. Now we have Amelia Simmons. So for those of you who aren't familiar with her, Amelia Simmons um, wrote basically the first American cookbook. Um, and we don't know very much about her at all. She wrote the cookbook. Um, she signed it first as an orphan. So it was by an orphan. Um, and it was first published in Hartford, Connecticut in 1796. And it was reprinted in Albany the same year. Um, and it's considered the first American cookbook for a lot of reasons, but the primary one is its prevalent use of American indigenous ingredients, particularly corn. So she has Indian pudding, she has cornbread, um, I think a cornmeal-based pasty pudding is in there. She uses pumpkin and cranberry. Um, she uses pearl ash, which is a very early chemical leavener, um, similar to what we now use as baking soda. Um, and she also kind of put a little bit of a Dutch spin on things with the use of the word cookie instead of the British biscuit. So it's kind of this fusion of British and um, Connecticut and New England, New York food traditions um, that she really was writing for an ordinary audience. Like her title is extremely long, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but uh, she talks about how it's for households without servants right, which is also a term in the 18th century for slaves. So it was for basically lower class to middle class people who were doing their own cooking, which was unlike a lot of the published British cookbooks, which were designed for very large households with lots of servants doing a lot of entertaining, um, not so much with Amelia's recipe. Uh, we do also have with Indian pudding specifically um, baked versus boiled. I said in the video that there were three different Indian pudding recipes in her cookbook. Indian pudding number one um, is quite different. It only calls for seven tablespoons of cornmeal to six cups of milk, but it also adds raisins, which some people are more familiar with. So that one would be much more custardy because it would have a very high um, milk to egg ratio. That's the one that calls for seven eggs and a much lower cornmeal ratio. I picked the second one um, in large part because it was much more similar to the Indian pudding recipes that survive through to the 19th century and then are also revived in the 20th century, which we're gonna talk about. But her third Indian pudding recipe is actually a boiled pudding. Um, so that's the kind of pudding, like if you've ever seen um, illustrations from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, there's a round, Christmas pudding with the hard sauce and the little sprig of holly on top. Round puddings like that were boiled in bags as opposed to molds, which are much more Victorian. Um, so that's the kind of thing that she's talking about as well. And I didn't really want to have to boil a pudding. And in general, boiled puddings are not as nice as baked puddings, in my opinion, anyway. Um, in the period, Indian pudding would have been baked in a bake oven. Uh, which would have been or a beehive oven which would have been built into the side of the fireplace you would fill it with hot coals to get it really hot rake the coals out it had a cast iron door and then as the the oven gradually cooled you would bake things in succession starting with the things that needed the hottest oven first so if you were doing like um, cakes or cookies or bread you would do those first and then all the way on down to the very last thing you might do is put in a pot of beans, shut the oven and leave it overnight to cook overnight, right? So Indian pudding is more toward the end of that. You're baking it at a lower temperature for longer. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about corn. Corn is 
kind of unique in that um, it is the primary indigenous grain in the United States, um, in North and South America, actually. It's native to Mexico, um, particularly Northern Mexico. Um, and it comes from a wild grass called Teosinti, which will, I have a picture of that next. Um, but it was basically uh, domesticated. The indigenous people in Mexico um, domesticated Teosinti into what we know today as corn. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different varieties of corn. Um, and both the Aztecs and the Maya used corn extensively. Um, and for the Maya in particular, the Aztecs used the corn in religious ceremonies, but for the Maya, um, their creation story was that um, people were made from corn, which translates into a number of um, indigenous nations in North America as well. That's people being created from corn comes from their, uh, as part of their religion and their mythology. So corn starts in Mexico and it migrates its way through to North and South America by the time Europeans start arriving um, in the Northeast. Uh, corn is pretty widely used by indigenous people. Um, it's very easy to grow. It has a very high yield um, per acre for the amount of effort that you put into it. Um, and what becomes established in a lot, but not all indigenous nations throughout the country is this concept of three sisters agriculture. And it's a type of companion planting where you're planting corn, beans, and squash together. So you have your corn is growing very tall. You have climbing pole beans that climb up the corn and also fix nitrogen into the soil, which corn needs a lot of fertilizer or, or nitrogen. Um, and then you plant squash around it and the broad squash leaves help shade uh, the soil and keep moisture in the soil, which corn can also be kind of a water hog. So together, those three foods um, were grown in this style of companion planting uh, in which they are kind of providing a symbiotic relationship to each other. And that became very important for a lot of indigenous people. Um, and then finally, as I said, corn plays a lot of religious and ceremonial roles uh, in a lot of indigenous cultures in the US. Again, not all, there are definitely um, some nations get their primary starch from other sources, notably uh, in the Pacific Southwest, <laughs> you know, California area in particular, there's um, a much higher reliance on acorns um, and acorn meal instead of corn and corn meal. But corn was pretty widely planted throughout what becomes the United States. All right, and this is a photo um, of three different varieties of corn kind of in the domestication process. So the very first one at the top is wild teosinte. Um, it still grows wild uh, in Mexico. The one in the middle is kind of like a crossbred version. And then at the bottom, uh, we have a more modern variety of corn. So you can kind of see it's a pretty distinct evolution from the wild teosinte all the way up to corn. Um, Teosinti is still used particularly as animal fodder in a lot of parts of Mexico. And the corn that results from a lot of this breeding is very diverse. You have all different colors. Um, in fact, the Maya creation story says that um, people were made from the various colors of corn. Like uh, white corn was the bones, yellow corn was the muscle, black corn was the eyes and hair, and red corn was the blood. For people. So that gives you a sense of the different varieties. There's also blue corn, um, rainbow corn. If you've ever heard of bloody butcher corn, that is a very dark, very red corn. Um, so there's all different kinds of varieties. Uh, and then this is an image from the Florentine Codex showing Aztec people storing maize or corn. You can see the corn cobs there and they're putting it in this um, built storage place for long-term use. This is another very early image from the 16th century. Um, it's the Timucua, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, people of Florida. And it says they're cultivating a field. It says they're, cult they're planting 
corn or beans. Um, it's hard to tell. It kind of looks like beans, um, but it's kind of hard to tell. But uh, uh, that is an example, a very early European version of, of what the agricultural looked like. And then, of course, this is a Hopi woman grinding corn in 1911. Uh, the Hopi, a lot of indigenous people in the United States called the Hopi like the original people or the oldest people. Um, and they are probably descended from the people who were domesticating corn in Mexico and the American Southwest. So grinding corn is a bit of a process, which we'll get into in a little bit, but this is another image of more traditional methods of corn use. So let's talk about the types of corn. Um, I said earlier that there are all kinds of colors, but there are actually a number of distinct types of corn and they all have different uses. Um, so one of the most common is flint corn, which is also known as Indian corn, right? If you around Thanksgiving are getting that beautiful, um, hard, glossy corn to hang on your door, that's actually an edible corn. <laughs> um, it was primarily used to make cornmeal and in the 19th and 20th century, um, it was also used as an animal feed. There's dent corn, also known as tooth corn. Um, and that's because the end of the corn, um, particularly when it's dry, gets a little indentation on it. So it kind of looks like a molar. Um, and that was used primarily for grits and corn flour. It's a little bit finer. In the 20th century in the modern era, it's used to make corn oil, corn syrup, but again, they use it as animal feed. There's flour corn which has a very soft, starchy germ, and that's for making a very fine flour, unlike cornmeal. And then there's popcorn, which is my personal favorite. So those are the main types of corn that would have been available to indigenous people. Um, so there is some crossover in the use, uh, and definitely certain nations had certain varieties that they cultivated. Um, but that just gives you an idea. I didn't put it on here, maybe I did, yes I did. Sweet corn is actually a modern invention. So if you hear a reference to or read references to sweet corn or green corn um, in the 18th and 19th century, what they're talking about is they're actually eating the young varieties of pretty much all of these types of corn except for maybe popcorn. Um, so when, when corn is very young, um, the starches, the sugars in the corn have not yet converted into starch. So if you've ever had like sweet corn that's old, not fresh, and you cook it up and it's like starchy and not very sweet and not very good, that's because it's sat too long and the sugars in the corn have started to convert into starch. Modern sweet corn has been bred specifically to be sweet. Um, a lot of it is genetically modified to be sweet. Um, but in the period, sweet corn would have just been young corn that's harvested before it's fully ripe. And particularly here in the Northeast, you may have heard about like green corn festivals in August um, as part of indigenous culture, and that's what they're talking about. All right, so Indian meals specifically has a pretty big hand in American history. I was thinking about, even before I started putting this talk together, what would the United States be like without cornmeal and corn? And it's a pretty different place, right? Um, so of course, Indian meal and corn saves the British colonists. Um, Tisquantum, also known as Squanto, uh, saves the English separatists. They're not, they didn't call themselves Puritans, they called themselves English separatists. Um, because all of the grains that they had brought from Europe we're not really doing a very good job at surviving in the harsher New England climates. Um, rye and barley were some of the only ones that did a decent job of growing. And British people in particular are used to consuming a lot of wheat. Uh, so it was difficult for them to make bread without cornmeal. Um, that has some unfortunate repercussions for the indigenous people, which we'll get into in a bit. Uh, but that's one of the primary ways that cornmeal and Indian meal in particular helped build what becomes the United States. Um, there are some differences between how indigenous people and European people treated corn and how they cooked it. So there's a process called nixtamalization, 
uh, whereby corn is treated with a wood ash or lye solution that kind of dissolves the husk um, and allows the, it's easier to grind. You can grind it fresh. Um, it's easier to make dumplings and bread out of, which is what indigenous people do primarily. Um, if you've ever had hominy, hominy is just corn that's been treated with lye, the nixtamalization process and cooked. If you've ever had masa, ever had like cornmeal tortinas that are made with masa, masa harina is nixtamalized cornmeal. Europeans didn't really do that. Um, and by the time we get to the late 19th, early 20th century, that becomes a real problem because when you don't nixtamalize corn, you don't free up the niacin that's present in the corn. If you just take dry corn and grind it up, which you can do and eat it, you can do that, but your body is not going to get any niacin out of it. But if you treat it with lye, that releases the niacin for the body to absorb. So niacin deficiency is also known as pellagra. It's not a nice disease. Um, if you don't get enough niacin, it's just not good. People died of it. Um, people died of it in Italy also, where polenta was widely adopted, but nixtamalization was not. So if you're subsisting on a poor diet that's primarily cornmeal, non-nixtamalized cornmeal, you're going to get pellagra. So that's what happens. This indigenous knowledge was kind of lost in the transfer. Um, it was a little bit with hominy, definitely hominy grits in the American South um, would have helped with that process, but not everybody did that. So Indian meal did also help Europeans adapt to a new climate. Like I said, rye um, and barley, buckwheat, were some of the only uh, grains that grew well in New England, um, and none of them are very good for making the kind of bread that most Europeans were used to, in large part because they don't have a lot of gluten. Um, but Indian meal was a way for people to stretch their kind of meager grain harvest um, and keep themselves in bread year round. And also cornmeal, um, cornbread was pretty widely adopted throughout New England. And again, like I said, if you can imagine American history without corn and cornmeal, it's a very different place. Um, as I said, corn is very easy to grow. It's easy to store, it stores well. It's fairly versatile um, and it really fueled a lot of westward expansion, which again, we have cornmeal because of indigenous people. Westward expansion was not nice to indigenous people at all. So I think there's some kind of complicated history to acknowledge there, um, but the United States would not be what it is today without corn. So speaking of complicated history, um, I did, I talked a little bit about Thanksgiving, I think at our last talk about pumpkins and pumpkin pie. This is a very romanticized image from 1932 of the first Thanksgiving of 1621. You know, there's the noble Puritan housewife graciously handing out cornmeal cakes to what appear to be Plains Indians, <laughs> indigenous people from the Plains. I don't know why they're here in New England. Um, this, of course, is a totally false narrative. That's not what the first Thanksgiving was. Cornmeal was present and cornbread was probably present. Um, it looks like the woman on the table might have a large dish of cornmeal mush. So that part, at least, is relatively accurate. But pretty much everything else about this image is wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, some complicated history going on there. Uh, I have a whole blog post about decolonizing Thanksgiving. Who anybody wants to look it up? Um, that goes a little more in detail. But I thought I would talk about this because we're talking about New England and this is a very stereotypical image that's associated with New England. All right, so we talked a little bit about corn. Let's talk about sugar, right? Because of course, one of the primary ingredients in um, Indian pudding is molasses, right? So sugar is also very old. Uh, it's native to Southeast Asia. Um, and people first started using it for the sweet juices and the stalks of the sugarcane about 10,000 years ago. 
Uh, in 350 BC, it migrates to India where it starts to be cultivated, starts to be cultivated in China in 550 BC. By 1000 AD, it reaches Europe, primarily along uh, the Silk Road, thanks to Muslim and Arab traders. Um, and it's used quite sparingly as a spice in Europe. Um, production was not high. It's a very labor intensive, energy intensive crop. Um, so it's really not until the 15th or 16th century that it starts to become widespread use uh, in Europe. And then the 17th century, thereabouts, maybe a little earlier, it gets imported to the Americas. And that's when production really starts to increase. Um, and there's a reason why production increases, because sugar is built on enslavement in North and South America. As I said, it's a very labor-intensive crop, um, so to make it cheaper, you have to bring down your labor costs, and you can do that by enslaving people. Um, in 1813, a guy by the name of Howard, his last name is Howard, I think his first name is Edward, um, invents something called the vacuum pan. So we're going to get into how sugar is made in a little bit and how molasses fits into that. Um, but his um, basically technological advancement was to cook the sugarcane juice at a lower temperature by putting it in a vacuum. So instead of open vats that would evaporate, um, he found that you could make the sugar boil at a lower temperature um, if you created a vacuum for it to be in. And that also reduced the caramelization process, which led to a whiter sugar product at the end. Um, so once that starts on 1813, it takes a while for it to be adopted, but uh, it really jump starts a lot of sugar production, which of course still in 1813 is based on slavery despite a bunch of abolition laws, which we'll get to in a second. So production explodes in the Caribbean in particular. Um, it was a 24 hour a day, six day a week enterprise, especially during harvest season. It was brutal, grueling work. Um, so not something that people would probably do willingly. So how the sugar plantations were arranged is that you had your enslaved people divided up into three gangs, they called them, and it was based largely on age and ability. So the first gang was mostly young adult men and women in their teens and 20s. They did the hardest physical labor, and at most people lasted 10 to 12 years of work um, on the first gang because it was just such awful hard labor that you would be physically debilitated enough that you would have to drop down to the second gang, which is mostly mature adult men and women. So their 20s to their to about 40. Um, again, if you lasted 20 years of work on the second gang, that was a lot. A lot of people did not survive. If you did survive, you made it to the third gang. That was for people 40 and up. If you made it to 40, um, as an enslaved person on the sugar plantation, your body was pretty wrecked. You looked a lot older than you actually were. Um, and they also had children work on this third gang. So this, they were doing work that was less um, physically intense, uh, but still necessary for this massive, cheap production of sugar. The death rate was extremely high. Very few people reached old age. Um, and throughout the eight, like the late 18th century um, to the mid 20th century, essentially, um, it was the death rate was so high that they were importing so many. They were like importing more people. <laughs> What's the thing they did? They said they ran across something that they said in like a, a five year period. They imported 330,000 people to this one Caribbean island where there was already an existing population of enslaved people. And at the end of that time, there were only 250,000 people there. So more than 100,000 people died over the course of just a few years working on these sugar plantations. 
All right, so how does sugar production work? Um, the images that I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides are a combination of images from um, a book called 10 Views of the Island of Antigua, which was published in 1823, um, and they were done by a guy named William Clark. And five of these views were republished in 1833 by the Lady Society for Promoting the Early Education of Negro Children in London. So this was like a women's society trying to teach um, African-American and African children, probably the children of slaves or former slaves, how to read. For some reason, they thought sugar production was a good way to do that. So these little books were published, um, designed to teach Black children how to read. These images have a distinct European bias, right? Um, it looks very pastoral. Everyone is well clothed. No one is being whipped or beaten in any of these images. Um, and then I also have a couple of images from another children's book called Cuffy, the Negro's Dog Roll Description of the Progress of Sugar, um, which is kind of an abolitionist text, but designed as a children's book. It's told from the pers perspective of Cuffy, which means if you look it up online, portions of it are digitized online. Um, the text is in a fairly offensive um, pidgin English because it's meant to to be the cadence of speech of this enslaved man, Cuffy. Um, and it's him talking about basically the process of sugar, but how awful it is for enslaved people. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna walk you through the various stages of sugar production using illustrations from these two books. So we start with preparing the soil. So this image is from William Clark. It's called Hoeing a Cane Piece. Uh, and you can see there's people marking out with stakes um, on the slope of land, these squares, and there's other people in the background hoeing. Um, and that is, they're preparing this field to be planted with sugar cane. And to do that, they had to dig cane holes. So you can see in the background of this image, there's a big military fort up on the hill. There's a windmill in the background. That's part of sugar production too, which we'll get to. But what these people are doing is they are digging cane holes, which are six to eight, sorry, four to six foot squares. They had to dig six to nine inches deep um, with hoes only, no spades, no shovels. All of the soil had to be carted away, carried away by hand um, and one, person would be expected to make 60 to 100 holes a day, which is about 1,500 cubic feet of soil that would have to be moved. And this is all to prepare um, the planting of sugarcane. And you can see they're laying, you kind of see in the bottoms of these holes, they're laying pieces of sugarcane sideways in the bottom of the holes. What happens next um, is that the holes had to be filled with manure animal dung. Um, it was carried in baskets, about 80 pounds at a time. They were carried on people's heads. This was done by the second gang. Um, this is an awful job. It's filthy. Everybody hated it. Um, but you were basically providing really rich soil for the sugarcane to grow. And the whole is to keep that manure in one area for that one piece of sugarcane. And again, moving hundreds if not thousands of pounds of manure every day by yourself. Okay, so once the sugar cane is fully grown, you can see in this image how tall it is, right? Um, the first gang, first gang would cut the sugar cane. And of course, they don't have any illustrations in this image of how far over they would have to bend. There's like the one guy in the yellow pants is bent over, but they had to cut the sugar cane six inches from the ground. So you're spending basically the entire day bent over. In the second gang, you can see there's cut and trimmed sugar cane. They would have to come and bundle it and carry it off and be loaded. And they worked in two shifts, two 12 hour shifts. Uh, so basically 24 hours a day, six days a week. And the thing about sugar cane is 
Um, if you don't start processing it very quickly, uh, it starts to kind of go bad. Like the, the sap in the cane starts to dry up um, or go bad. So you need to process it very, very quickly. So that's why part of the reason why they're working such a grueling, grueling pace. So this is the mill you probably saw in the background of one of the earlier images. Um, it's a windmill, powered mill, um, and it's basically a set of rollers. You can kind of see them illustrated. They're vertical rollers that you feed the cut cane through, um, and then the juice. You can see that there's this boiling house next to it. Um, the juice would just be piped down into the house. If you were feeding the cane in and you didn't move fast enough because you're freaking exhausted and your arm gets caught in the roller and your arm is crushed, they just chop your arm off. Yep. So you had one armed people enslaved working on some of these plantations because of that. So again, it looks very idyllic, right? But that's not necessarily the case. This is the European gaze and its translation. So this is the boiling house. So the cane juice is pumped directly in here. Um, and it has to go through multiple stages of boiling. It has to be boiled and skimmed up to five separate times uh, before it's transferred into uh, the cooling pans. Um, and there was one person, usually an enslaved man, who would decide, would keep an eye on things and decide when exactly um, the juice was to be tempered and cooled. So once the juice was cooled, um, it was put into barrels and let rest. So basically what happens is um, all of the molasses that's in this uh, granulated sugar cane uh, sinks to the bottom of the barrel. And then you can see they would kind of tap the bottom of the barrels to drain out the molasses and then the sugar could be dried for shipment. This here is a white man known as the sugar baker. Um, so he is filling cones with the sugar. And this, of course, is from Cuffey's description. And in the description that comes with this image, Cuffey says the sugar baker is adding blood or another adulterant to the sugar to make it white. So then it would be hardened into these white conical loaves and wrapped in blue paper for export to Europe or the Americas. So if you've ever heard of loaf sugar, that's what this is. And of course, molasses would also be exported, um, but for a very different reason. So molasses is the primary ingredient in rum. And molasses was part of something known as the triangle trade, uh, or sometimes called the triangular trade. So you had enslaved, Africans brought from Africa to the Caribbean, um, often sold for molasses or rum. Molasses was then exported from the Caribbean to the U.S. Um, for being, to be turned into rum. And then distilled rum was exported from the U.S. to Europe. And then some of it also sometimes made its way to Africa. But that was the extraordinarily lucrative uh, triangle trade based entirely on the enslavement of people. Uh, in 1733, British Parliament passed the Molasses Act in an effort to kind of curtail slash get some of the profits from all of the production, uh, the refining of molasses in the United States into rum. It was not a popular act. Um, most people did not follow it, and it helped contribute to a lot of the resentment that led to the American Revolution. Um, and then, so in large part, molasses was much cheaper than white sugar. Um, it was used by the gallon. It was in widespread use throughout the United States. Um, and again, it is a byproduct of the sugar industry, uh, which is in large part able to survive and be lucrative thanks to the enslavement of African people. Sugar in America. So in 1720s New York City, um, 
there were a number of sugar refiners. So you would also get um, molasses and sugar cane, like partially cooked or refined sugar cane from the Caribbean um, coming into New York City. And you got sugar refiners based right in New York City all the way up into the early to mid 20th century, Domino Sugar being one of those. Um, and because of the sugar industry in New York City, New York City had one of the biggest populations of enslaved people in the North, um, and at one point in the entire uh, colonies by population. Uh, in 1751, the first sugarcane is planted by Jesuit priest in French held Louisiana. Um, by 1795, the first sugar is granulated in Louisiana, which by then, um, sorry, not by then, which a few years later becomes part of the United States through the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and Louisiana becomes the major hub of sugar production in the United States uh, and also the major hub of enslavement in the United States. If you read or heard of the book and subsequently movie 12 Years a Slave, um, that is about Solomon Northup, who was a free man living in New York, um, enticed to Virginia with the promise of a job. He was a violinist, the promise of a musician's job. He is actually captured and sold into slavery, and he spends 12 years on a Louisiana sugarcane plantation. So in 1853, he tells his story along with a lot of the brutality uh, that was happening on that sugar plantation. Now, he luckily escaped and made his way back to freedom, but that was not the case for most people working on those plantations. So sugar also plays a pretty big role in abolition for that reason. On 1791, a British abolition bill fails and British abolitionists begin to boycott sugar, especially West Indian sugar, which was the product of slavery. It's one of the first consumer boycotts uh, in the world. Um, even though slavery was abolished officially in 1807, it continued in the colonies, especially the West Indies. Um, so in the 1820s, there was another abolition movement in Britain, uh, which influenced abolitionists in the United States. Um, and in the 1840s, there was something called the Free Produce Movement, which was whereby abolitionists issued and called for boycotts of cotton and sugar because they were products of slavery. Um, and for sugar in particular, they offered up a number of alternatives, including maple syrup, um, which as early as the late 18th century was kind of being boosterized in the Northeast as an alternative to slavery produced sugar. Um, Thomas Jefferson commented on it. Other people were talking about how it's free sugar. It's more American sugar, right? Because it's produced by white people. Um, and between 1850 and 1857, which is kind of the height of the abolitionist boycott, um, maple syrup production actually doubled in the United States. Um, we also looked into alternatives such as sorghum molasses and sorghum sugar, which is, um, sorghum is kind of similar to sugar cane in that it's kind of a cane and that produces um, a sweet sap, um, but it's much easier to grow and it doesn't require quite uh, the level of labor that sugar cane does. Um, so it's much easier to turn into uh, syrup, sorghum syrup and sorghum molasses, which is still kind of popular as sort of an indigenous sweet uh, in the South. And then of course also honey was offered up as an alternative. So there were lots of political cartoons in Britain. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's called the gradual abolition off the slave trade or leaving of sugar by degrees. So that's kind of a play on words that it's the gradual, gradual abolition of the slave trade and leaving off sugar. So now they're saying, oh, we're gonna gradually get off of slavery and take our leave of sugar. So pictured here are King George III, um, who by 1792 
was kind of going crazy with his wife there to his left um and then his daughters are to his right and his wife's um keeper of the robes is holding a bottle of brandy so they're talking about using sugar in moderation and whether or not they should you know stop using it entirely or oh i must have a little sugar right so it's kind of pointing out the hypocrisy of um the use of sugar in light of the slave trade and morality and the queen in particular is holding up a set of scales and she's got her little sugar tongs in the sugar bowls if she's going to weigh out how much sugar is acceptable to use um there were also a number of um sugar bowls produced in association with um with the abolition movement this one is particularly interesting because it says east india sugar not made by slaves so east india of course being the country of india which was part of the british empire and they did have quite a bit of sugarcane production there but it was not um technically with enslaved people although uh the uh conditions were probably not that great either but technically not enslaved people so you could kind of have your sugar and eat it too. All right, so that's our history of sugar and molasses. I wanted to talk a little bit about fusion cooking in New England. I think in the United States, we kind of associate New England so much with early American cuisine that we forget that it's actually New England, right? That it's heavily influenced by British cuisine, but it really is a fusion of indigenous foods British traditions and cooking techniques, and also West African um, cooking techniques from people who were enslaved. So in this particular instance, you do have a very high prevalence of the use of cornmeal. You have Johnny or Journey cake, um, which in Rhode Island in particular uses white cornmeal, and that's like their state bread, basically. Um, there's something called Ryan Injun bread, which is um, a yeasted bread that's a combination of rye flour and Indian or uh, Indian meal or cornmeal. Anadama bread is a combination of wheat flour and cornmeal. And of course, we already talked a little bit about pasty pudding and mush. Um, so those are all very prevalent in New England, kind of throughout the 19th, there the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century. Um, there's also the prevalence in the use of corn itself, secotash, both the fresh and dried versions um fresh succotash you have uh fresh sweet corn basically young corn um mixed with fresh lima beans um there is also a dried version this comes particularly from indigenous people though usually not with the addition of cream but you cook dried or parched corn uh with dried beans to make kind of a stew there's also corn chowder um corn pudding and spoon breads and of course people also just ate corn, corn on the cob that way. Molasses also has an intense prevalence in New England. It's present in baked beans, gingerbread, brown bread, which is a steamed bread. It's almost like a type of pudding, um, like Christmas pudding, but it's a type of steamed bread. Joe Frogger cookies, which are a large um, molasses cookie invented by a black uh, innkeeper and his wife in Massachusetts. There's fruit cake. Right, dark fruit cake uses um, molasses. You have steam puddings. People use molasses as pancake or waffle syrup. Um, in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Dutch tradition, you have shoe fly pie. And then people also use it as a sweetener for everything, um, but especially pumpkin and sweet potato pie. It was a very common alternative to um, sugar. So, what does it mean when we're talking about creating New England? foods and food ways, right? So I think there's this concept in the United States that New England foods are like our foundational foods. They're our first foods. It's true American cuisine, but that has not been the case throughout American history. And it's, that concept is the result of a concerted effort to make New England cuisine or remake New England cuisine in that image. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the Civil War and Thanksgiving. 
<laughs> right? So while we're fighting the Civil War, um, you know, the South has very different ideas of what is culture and cuisine than the North. Um, and there, there had been prior to the Civil War an effort to turn Thanksgiving into a national holiday. So of course, Thanksgiving, based on um, the pilgrims, the Puritan in New England, um, you know, kind of held up as this foundational first thing in in the United States that we all need to pay homage to. But to people in the South, that's Yankee history that didn't have anything to do with them. And while their reasoning <laughs> for rejecting it is not exactly great, because they were like, let's uphold slavery instead, um, it's a valid criticism. Um, in particular, because there were other European settlements throughout what becomes North America prior to 1621, notably in um, New York and Florida and other places. Um, so it's not just New England, they're not the first. Um, so that's an issue that's happening. And Thanksgiving becomes formalized as a national holiday during the Civil War, um, kind of after Southern secession, so they didn't really have a say in it. And it kind of continues to have that sort of fraught tension uh, after the Civil War for a number of reasons. And that's when I was talking about pumpkins, that's part of the reason why you have sweet potato pie in the South, that's a rejection of the Yankee pumpkin. Um, but toward the end of the 19th century, as we're undergoing reconstruction and kind of the rejection of reconstruction, there's this desire to unify the country under like one American um, culture. And New England food becomes part of that um, spreading of American culture. So it becomes, like I said, part of making an American cuisine, that New England is supposedly the storied foundational cuisine. Um, it's our British heritage. It kind of combines a lot of these indigenous foods. Of course, indigenous people are never given credit for any of those foods, really, except for Indian meal is like the only lingering um, connection that survives. Um, and a lot of this is kind of solidified in the early 20th century with colonial revival and the nostalgia associated with that. So ironically, in at our centennial in 1876, um, there was not a lot of nostalgia about the colonial times. Uh, we were really looking forward. It was the centennial exposition in Philadelphia was really about the future, not the past. Um, but a series, whoops, a series of um, depressions, economic depression, starting in 1893 and really culminating with the Great Depression in 1929, um, really brought about this sense of both colonial revival and nostalgia. Because whenever there's an economic depression, people get nostalgic for the good old days, right? You look backwards with your hindsight is 2020 and your rose-colored glasses. You pick and choose what you think is the best of the past and say, oh, if only it was like that now, right? So colonial revival really takes off in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and with it, kind of this revival of New England food ways and an interest in preserving these old ways of cooking. Part of that also has to do with the fact that the turn of the 20th century is a time of enormous um, technological and social and political change. So again, people are getting nostalgic uh, for the past and the things that they know um, and want to hold on to. Um, the 1976 bicentennial really does help solidify this sort of ongoing colonial revival. Like once we get into the Great Depression, the colonial revival doesn't really stop. Um, it continues in the 1930s, it continues in the 1940s, particularly during World War II, with all of the patriotism around World War II, um, kind of hearkening back to the Founding Fathers um, and Thanksgiving and Pilgrims and those foundational foods, those old-fashioned foods really come back into style. And that continues with the Bicentennial. Uh, you get a real interest in um, oral histories and republishing historic cookbooks and historic community cookbooks. Um, and New England 
does play a role in that, not quite as big of a role as the turn of the 20th century. You do start to get, because it's the bicentennial, other states have like their own bicentennial cookbooks reflective of their regional food ways. Um, but New England continues to hang on as kind of that American food. So how does Indian pudding fit into all of this? So Indian pudding is like this weird representative of New England, kind of along with you know, Boston baked beans and pumpkin pie and cranberry sauce um, that isn't as popular, but kind of keeps hanging around on the fringes. So this is an advertisement for sun-made raisins from 1918, which was during uh, World War I. And I think part of the reason why World War I starts to be a little bit of a catalyst for the Indian pudding revival is because uh, wheat was scarce and voluntarily rationed, although it was kind of officially rationed. So Americans were really encouraged to eat cornmeal, a lot more cornmeal than they might have previously. So I find it very interesting that Indian pudding is the primary feature of this advertisement. They have a couple of other desserts at the bottom. Like I think there's mince pie and there's rice pudding. And stuff like that. It's not a very high quality image, so it's hard to tell. Um, but Indian pudding is a thing that they choose to uphold, I think because it's representing kind of this New England food way and being patriotic and it's cornmeal. And so it's kind of ticking all of these things that they, the government wants you to do in World War I. And Sunmade is using it as an advertisement to sell their raisins. Now, some of you may have first encountered Indian pudding at Howard Johnson's, right? So this is an advertisement from probably around 1970, 1960, judging by the image. So you have a dish of Indian pudding sitting on top of Indian corn, right? Hot baked Indian pudding with ice cream. That is like the quintessential 20th century way um, to consume Indian pudding. Uh, Indian pudding becomes sort of this dessert of choice for New England tourism. It ends up on a lot of hotel menus and a lot of restaurant menus, particularly in tourist areas. Um, and it's kind of like this weird little side forgotten dessert <laughs> that isn't particularly well known outside of New England, but people who have it um, seem to love it. And having tasted it now myself, I can kind of see why. All right, so Let's revisit what American food actually means. Now, I put this on here with a lot of love because I like New England and I think they have very interesting regional food culture, but I'm putting culture, cultural tyranny of New England because it has kind of a bit of a tyrannical grasp on the United States and sort of, you know, being in New England technically, although New York is really New Netherland, um, you know, we think about the seasons in a very specific way, particularly in the fall, we can identify with Thanksgiving. Um, but for a lot of the rest of the country who doesn't experience that, it is kind of a cultural tyranny if you think about it. Um, what the heck does when a pumpkin spice latte is available have to do with anything about the seasons in California or Florida? You know, but it's got this sort of national veneer on it, even though it's very geographically and culturally specific to the Northeast. So I talk about the culinary tyranny, the cultural tyranny of New England, because it does have this kind of grip on our national culture um, that I think is outsized uh, in terms of maybe its actual historical influence, right? So how else can we revisit what American food actually means. So for me, that means recognizing um, the indigenous foundation of a lot of American food ways, both in terms of the ingredients that are part of our food ways and also um, some of the cooking techniques. Definitely the connection to African and African-American labor and expertise, because again, a lot of American food throughout the East Coast, but including the Northeast, um, is very influenced by uh, African contributions, even though we don't always recognize them. 
uh, recognizing the racist and somewhat white supremacist influence of the cultural tyranny of New England. Um, and then also recognizing that there's a real regional diversity in American food that ironically, I think has cornmeal and molasses running through most of it. I think most of the United States um, does have some food history connected to both cornmeal and to a lesser extent molasses, um, which is ironic. But let's let's celebrate the diversity of American food instead of trying to pigeonhole it um, as to being coming from New England, kind of that, that fusion of indigenous British and African food ways. And so how else can you do this? You can support Black, Indigenous, and people of color by purchasing from um, BIPOC producers, uh, agriculturalists, food producers, um, by patronizing their restaurants, by supporting their food historians and cookbook authors, and just let's generally promote a more inclusive and honest, historically honest version of American food and our American food history. So that concludes my talk. Do we have any questions? I didn't notice any in the chat as we were going along, but I think we can open it up for discussion if Krista wants to let people unmute themselves. Everybody should be able to unmute if they want, um, or you can just use the chat. So feel free to ask any questions. I like it when people ask questions, so don't be shy. <laughs> I can't have been that good at my talk that I didn't make, leave any questions for people. Well, if that's it, uh, please join us in January and February. Sarah will be back uh, talking about some more fun food facts. I believe January is the history of mac and cheese. Yes, it and is. January is the history of hot chocolate. And uh, we have, uh, so those programs will open up for registration the end of December. Our calendar should be live by the last week of December. So, um, and also I'll be emailing everybody who came to these programs, the actual video presentations. Um, we are recording all of them and they will be on our YouTube channel. I believe the first two are on there already and this one should be on there by the end of the week. So if you missed anything or you wanna go back, you can always rewatch the videos at your own pace. And um, I will also be, once the video is live on the library's YouTube channel, what I do, what I'll do is I'll do a whole blog post um, with the recipe and all the steps and, and some of the background history um, on my blog, which is thefoodhistorian.com. So if anybody didn't catch the recipe as we were going through um, and they want to try it out themselves, I will be doing a follow-up blog post. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And look oh, forward to I do have one question about Emily said, actually, she asked, are there any regional variations in Indian pudding recipes? Um, there don't seem to be a ton of variations. The primary variation seems to be whether or not you add raisins, which uh, Amelia Simmons uh, Indian pudding number one does include, but that seems to be the primary, the primary difference. And then Renee says, how do I pick my topics for this discussion? Well, Krista actually requested the cooking demo, and I don't remember, I think I just came up with some options of stuff I wanted to make <laughs> and yeah, thought yeah, would yeah. be interesting to talk about. So it's a very haphazard planning process. <laughs> um, but if anybody has any requests for future talks, I can't promise that I'll do them all, but I'll get to them eventually. Oh, now everybody's dropping questions in the chat. Uh, Eleanor says, are you still doing every other Friday night? So I have been doing on Facebook a food history happy hour, I call it, which is a live stream on Facebook. I am going to try and do one in December, but all of my um, Fridays are booked right now, so I might have to be on a Saturday, but keep an eye on my, on my website and I will update there. Um, just cooking in World War II, I will definitely put that on the list. Um, Elia said, did molasses ever become as popular in the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Coast as it was in the East Coast? Um, I don't think so. 
uh, in large part because it was settled quite late compared to other parts of the country, but definitely the early, um, you know, kind of pioneer settlement would have brought um, molasses with them. But I think because it wasn't in use for as long, it kind of doesn't stick around, excuse me, stick around quite as much. And also by the time a lot of that settlement happens, um, refined white sugar uh, becomes much cheaper. So by the end of the 19th century, end of the 20th century, molasses kind of falls by the wayside as the primary sweetener because um, sugar production becomes much cheaper. All right. Oh, Emily, how did the blood make the sugar white? I think, I think that was like abolitionist propaganda to try and make um, people be really sympathetic to the cause of abolition, abolition and also be like anti sugar. So Mary's asking, um, what's the website? So I'm just dropping it in the chat. It's thefoodhistorian.com. Uh, I got upcoming talks and my blog on there. You can follow me on Facebook. And yeah, we'll have fun at our next talk. Oh, I think you have one more question. Oh, one more. Okay. Um, unsul so sulfuring foods is a way of preserving them. So Emily asked, what does unsulfured molasses mean? So that just means molasses that has not had sulfur add as a preservative. So they do similar things with apricots. If you've ever seen unsulfured apricots that are like a sad brown color, <laughs> as opposed to the sulfured ones, which are nice and bright orange, um, that's the difference. It's just a preservative additive. Yes, unsulfured is more historically accurate, yes. Oh, molasses from rum. So um, rum is just distilled from molasses, molasses provides the sugar um, to make the alcohol that becomes rum. I did not look too much into the details of rum distillation, um, but I am sure it's out there. But it, it does come, it does come from molasses. All right, any last questions? I think rum, they want to talk about rum <laughs> as a future topic, which sounds pretty fun to me. <laughs> well, maybe maybe we'll do a food history happy hour and talk about rum. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you again, Sarah. Um, Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Looking forward to next month. Um, I think it's January 28th, I believe, or 27th. I think it's the 27th because it's yeah. the day after my birthday. Ah, that's a fun birthday gift. Uh, and so thank you everybody for coming out and uh, we will hopefully see you next month for our next talk. Good night. Good night.